Thing. This program is being presented on behalf of all of the chapters in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island District of SCORE. My name is Jim Danhauser. I'm a volunteer mentor with the Cape Cod and Islands chapter of SCORE, and I wanted to cover just quickly a few introductory items before turning things over to our facilitator for today's session, my friend and colleague, Mark Goldberg. For those of you who aren't familiar with SCORE, we're a fully volunteer nonprofit organization and a resource partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Our mission is to foster vibrant small business communities through mentoring and education. We've been doing this work since our founding in 1964 through educational opportunities like this webinar and by providing mentoring assistance to people who are in business or who are thinking about starting a business. Each chapter in our district has a significant number of volunteer mentors and subject matter experts with a broad array of business experience and expertise, all of whom stand ready to provide mentoring assistance to you in connection with your business activities. And we can connect you with volunteers across the country, enabling us to meet the needs of virtually every client. Importantly, all of this mentoring is completely free and absolutely confidential. It's very easy to sign up for a SCORE mentor if you'd like to do so. You can go to the SCORE national website. That's www.score.org. Go to the Find a Mentor tab and click on Request a SCORE Mentor to get going. Or you can go to the website listed here for the chapter that covers your geographic area and click on the Find a Mentor tab. If you'd like, you could also enter your geographic location, your name and email address in the chat and we'll get the process started for you. A few quick rules for today. I ask that you use the Q&A feature to ask any questions. Use the chat only for comments. I'll be keeping track of questions as they come in and posing them to Mark on a timely basis. And it's just much easier to do that if I only have to follow one feature as opposed to toggling back and forth. Aware as well, you should be that the webinar is being recorded We'll be sending an email in the next day or two, which will give you a link to that recording as well as some supplementary information. And finally, our facilitator for today is my colleague, Mark Goldberg. Mark's a mentor with the Cape Cod and Islands chapter. He's a very experienced and accomplished business executive, and we're fortunate that he has agreed to lead today's discussion. So Mark, take it away. Okay, thanks, Jim. Let me uh, just open my screen and there we go. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. And today we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite topics and that's business planning. But we're gonna talk about it in a different format. And I'll give you uh, just a short story. I met with a new client this morning uh, my co-mentor and I sat down and it was the first session. So it was a discovery session. And uh, it was obvious that the client was all over the map, not only with what they thought they were offering, but who, to whom they were offering it to and what they thought the benefits would be. So we said, well, one of the things that you may want to think about is a business plan. Eyes rolled back in his head. And we thought, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not talking about the traditional business plan that people need when they need funding. We're talking about a simple way of planning the path for launching a small business. Now, I have to tell you, my wife and I uh, owned a trade show marketing company for almost 30 years. From the very beginning in 1985, long before Business Model Canvas was available, we had a business plan, and it was a one-page business plan just so we could keep track of where we were, where we wanted to go, and how we wanted to get there. So what I'd like to do today is give you an overview of the business model canvas, and how to use it, whether you're a for-profit, whether you're a nonprofit, or you're already in business and you want to expand your business because it's a great way to think through where you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. In 1985, as I was launching my business, I went to a webinar, a workshop actually, in California. And it was headed by a man named Peter Johnson, who at that point was one of the marketing planning gurus. 
Now, we all like to go to workshops and webinars and walk away with something they, that we remember and can take action on. Well, Peter Johnson said one thing that I've remembered all these years, and I think about it every time I think about a plan, I think about an approach, I think about how we're going to get from where we are today to where we want to go, and that is accuracy before momentum. I have a client that wanted to start a business in using a trailer. And we started talking about how to utilize uh, this trailer. And I said to her, one of the things you really need to do before you even start thinking about what this trailer is gonna look like, how you're gonna outfit it, et cetera, is go to the county health department and find out what are the rules and regs. She was so excited, she outfitted the trailer and found out she could not get a permit in Barnstable County. So I want you to think about accuracy before momentum. Go slow, understand everything you need to do in order to make it happen in the end. Now, one of the other guidelines that we use is crawl, walk, run. When you're planning a small business, it's okay to crawl at first. And as you start generating revenue, as you start generating profit, then walking. And as you were walking and having, and you're upright and you're making progress, it's okay then to run. So what I want you to do is think in terms of making sure that you understand that the planning process is just that. It's a process. It's a means of communicating. It's a means of communicating to employees, if you have employees to investors, to the bank. It's a way of communicating so that they know exactly where you are and what your plans are. I used to sit down every year with my banker when I lived in Westboro, Massachusetts, and sat down with my plan and exposed the bank manager to what we were planning to do in the next year so that if we needed an infusion of capital, that the bank manager understood what the business was, where we were going, what our, the health of our business was, so that we weren't starting from ground zero if, in fact, we had to rely on the bank for some working capital. It's also a guide. It's a guide for measuring your performance. One of the things somebody said to me years ago is never set an objective without a metric. So I want you to think about how do you measure your performance and how do you manage the business without a plan? So you want to think in terms of how you're going to get from point A to point B. You know, somebody said to me many years ago that business is fairly simple. Here you are, that's point A. Here's where you want to be, point B. And what's stopping you from getting from point A to point B? Those are the objectives that you have to set for yourself. And a plan does that. Now, when we think about a plan, it answers two questions. One, where do you want to go? Well, I want 10% of the marketplace in my geographic area. I want 10 new Fortune 100 customers in the next 12 months. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And it answers the question, how are you going to get there? What are the strategies and tactics you're going to use? Now, without going back to Marketing 101, strategies are what are you going to do? And tactics are how are you going to accomplish the strategies? So if you say that your strategy, your objective is increasing name awareness, and your strategy is to position yourself in the mind of all senior citizens on Cape Cod, one of the tactics you may be is become a speaker at the newcomers clubs, or at the senior centers, or get yourself in the newsletters of every retired men's or women's clubs. So what you want to do is think in terms of your plan lays out where you want to go and how you're going to get there. But you want to make sure that it's only as long as it's essential to convey the message. A one-page business plan may suffice, or you may need a second page. And I'll give you a reason for a second page in a few minutes. But you want to make sure that it's only as long as it needs to be. 
one of my very first clients was a venture capital company. And I was doing market analysis for them. And they would give me 40, 50 page business plans and people spent 10, 20, $30,000 developing. They didn't realize that the venture capital company only re read the condensed version of it in the executive summary. If it caught their interest, they read farther. So what you want to make sure is that your message is the important thing. And it's the message to yourself, to your employees, to your bank, to your investors. <clears throat> and it's a living instrument. Our business plan was the subject of every quarterly meeting where we reviewed. Well, what did we say in January that we were going to do? How did we say we were going to do it? And what are the tactics that we decided to use? Were they valid? Did they work? If they didn't, we modified it. And that's important to understand that a business plan is not static. Why isn't it static? Because the environment in which we are working is constantly changing, whether it be political, whether it be environment, the environment itself, whether it be economic, whether it be human resource, whatever it is, it's always changing. So you have to look at those environmental factors that impact your business, your business idea, and change it and modify it and update it. Now, some of you may need a business plan that requires you to go the larger, longer route. If you look at the SBA website, there's a, there's a template. If you go to www.seedcorp.com, there's even a better one. And if you go to, to the Seed Corp and go to resources and drop down, you'll find a template for the uh, website. And what it is, it's right here, a business plan booklet. The advantage of this one is it asks you questions rather than just says, define your business. It asks you a series of questions. It helps you with the narrative that you have to write. Regardless of the length of the plan, think in terms of this is a story. It's a story about you. It's a story about your team. It's a story about your business, a story about your competitors. It's a story about how your business will function. So what you want to do is reduce the amount of repetition because many of the templates that you'll find are very repetitive and make it so that it's digestible and understood by readers. All right. So business model canvas. Business model canvas was designed by an organization called Strategizer in Europe. It was designed as a lean business model plan. It was designed for high tech, but as you will see, it, is, it can be applied to any type of business, whether it be for-profit or non-profit. The canvas is a tactical tool. It's a tool that you can lay out all the elements of your business and follow it. It's dynamic. It's a brainstorming tool. The advantage of it being one page is you can line out an assumption that you made if you find that it's not valid. It's also one that can be used for operating the business, which is nice because it's not only a planning tool, but an operating tool. And what it does is it sets the framework. If you have to do a full, play, full plan, it's the framework and you can build upon it you don't have to start from scratch. So what are the nine blocks? The nine blocks start with, what do you do? Your value proposition. The do is your offer. And we'll talk about this in detail. Second, who are you going to help? Your customers. Third, how are you going to reach them? What tools can you use to reach your customer segments? And there may be more than one. How do you interact with them? Is it one and done? Is it on a subscriber basis? How do you interact with them? Do they come to you? Do you go to them?
Well, I was, uh, I was having a great time here. <laughs> uh, so everybody knows Mark had no idea that he he had been disconnected from us. Is this where we were? Yes. And you had just finished number four. I was on a roll. Okay. How's that? That's perfect. Okay. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay. So these are the nine blocks. And uh, when we think about uh, customer relationships, we're thinking about how do we interact with our customers? Are they subscribers? Or do we go to them? Do they come to us? Are they one and done? We also then want to look at key activities, key resources, and key partners in order to execute the work that we do. What revenue streams do we have in, in generating income? And then what will it cost us to launch the business? What will it cost us to operate the business? Now, one example is a very specific business, and that is platform to connect riders with drivers. Anybody have any idea who that is? And Jim, if you see the, you can see the, the, uh, I can see the chat. So people, if you have the answer, throw it in the chat. Easiest way around anytime, anywhere, low cost luxury. Anybody have an idea? What company First guess is Uber. Absolutely. Uber. See how simple it is. Very straightforward. One liners, they're riders, people who need a ride are their customers. Also drivers are their customers, people who want to earn money driving. So this approach is very straightforward and very easy to lay out. But if in fact you find that one of them is not applicable, you can just line it out because it's an assumption until you validate it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So what we want to think about is what value do we deliver to our customers? The value proposition. And the value proposition is not what we do. It's what we offer. Now, I'm going to use the company that my wife and I had for almost 30 years as an example as we go through here. The value that we delivered was performance improvement. And we did it through training and measurement, but that isn't the value. That's what, what, people, that's what people bought from us was performance improvement. What problems are we solving? So we ask ourselves, what need, want, or desire are we fulfilling? So we ask ourselves, what's so compelling about what we offer? And who are we doing it for? And what gain are we creating for our customers? But the big issue that we, are, that we have to concern ourselves with is differentiation. What is the competitive advantage that we have over others who are offering the same thing that we were. People would ask us, okay, what differentiates you amongst the other four people that were offering performance improvement? And we said, we approach this from a marketing standpoint. And because trade shows and events are marketing tools, our whole approach is marketing. So when you think <coughs> in terms of the value proposition, you wanna think in terms of not what you do, not that you mow lawns, not that you paint houses, not that you have a hardware store, but what is it that you are solving in the way of a problem? Now, I want you to think about your customers and you. Your customer is trying to get something accomplished. They are having pains. They are not generating enough leads at their trade shows. They are not generating enough sales as a result of the leads they're generating. They are not getting enough attention in their exhibit. So we over here, we design pain relievers for them. And these pain relievers are the solutions. And those solutions become gains for them. And when we do that, then what we have is a value proposition that meets the needs, wants, and desires of our customer base. 
So if you look at Uber, it to be if you look at Uber, that's one set of value drivers. But if you look at Waze, which almost every one of us use, so we don't get lost. So we don't have to kids, our kids in the back seat asking, are we almost there? Because we don't have no idea where we're going, like my father used to do. They have their value proposition for drivers is be traffic. I'm driving down six and there's a traffic jam between exit two and three. And lo and behold, it says, get off on route 130 and you can go around it. It allows me to navigate any place. One, times my, one time my wife and I had to go to a meeting in New Jersey and we used our ways and we, it said left, right, right, left, left, right. We got there sitting in the parking lot and I said to her, I have no idea where we are, but we're here. But it allows us to navigate anywhere. It provides warnings, police ahead, car on the side of the road, debris in the road. But what it does most is makes it satisfactory. It makes us satisfied with going from point A to point B, getting us to where we want to go. Okay, so when we think about the advertisers, because you know every time you're driving, it says, hey, there's a McDonald's coming up or a Dunkin' Donut coming up. It makes it relevant for the drivers. You're also driving through Mississippi, and it tells you, oh, you need to stop here because there's a historic market marker. Well, I want you to also think about the fact that you're doing this for somebody or some bodies. So for whom are you creating value? Who are your customers that you're trying to create value? When you think about our business, our we had multiple levels of customer segments. Our number one customer was the exhibit director who they managed the exhibiting department or the events department. But another set was their management their marketing VP or the sales VP or the owner of the company. It also could have been the show organizer. So you need to identify each of the customer segments that you serve so that you are familiar and can look at the value propositions and design your value propositions around your customer segments. So when you look at your customers, you have to ask yourself, what do they think, see, feel, do? Why do they buy? What is it that triggers their purchase of your value proposition? And where are they located? Are you dealing with upper, mid, lower Cape, off Cape? Are you dealing with the whole of Northeast? You're dealing with the whole of the United States or the world? You have to look at the environmental factors that are affecting this market. And what age groups are you looking at? I had a client in Florida who was selling clothes for young teens. Well, young teens were their was were their market, but also their mothers were their mark was their market. Is this an in-person or an online business? Where is your market? Where are your customers? So what you have to do is understand to convey your value proposition, you have to clearly identify who your customers are. So you have focus. And that word is one of the biggest values, the most beneficial values of Business Model Canvas. It helps you focus on where you are, where you're going, and what are you gonna do to get there? Now let's go back to ways. Well, they had, geographic segments, they had drivers, their drivers who become part of a community, and they had roadside businesses, all individual segments that their value proposition has to be married to in order to communicate their message and a message that can be received. Thirdly, and this is really important, how many of you have ever heard of shotgun marketing? Well, that's what most people do. They throw the message out to the world and hope that somebody who is interested in their product or service receives it. When you question the channels, you're asking yourself, how do your customer segments receive their information? 
How do they get information? Because you need to be there. So you need to look at each one of, their, of your customer segments and say, where do they get their information? Now, our customers got most of their information either on websites, but in the early days, it was through our national magazine because there was no website. So what you want to think about is understanding. So how do you know? You ask. You ask your customer segments, where do they get their information? Now, I don't know about you, but the first place I get them information this mor in the morning is I turn on the news and I see what's going on. I see what the weather's going to be. Then I put it, put it on silent and read the Cape Cod Times online. Now, why do I do it online? Because I can't find my driveway. So that's where I, second piece of information. Then I read the New York Times, condensed version. So what you want to do is ask your customer segments, where do they get for their information? Because your value proposition is what you're going to be communicating. And you have to be in a place where they are. And if they, they're not there, then your, your messaging is going out into the wind. So what you want to do is make sure that you are focused on channels of information that allow you to communicate and build awareness. Now, I'm going to stop for a second and go back to Marketing 101. One of the big issues that small businesses have is awareness. We're in a very crowded communication environment. I once read that we are exposed to 1,500 to 2,000 marketing messages every day. If you don't believe me, just go in your bathroom and see how many brands are on products in your bathroom. And that's the first, most of us, the first thing that we see every day. So I want you to think about a process that is you in, can engage in order to build awareness. And it starts with unawareness. Most of you who are starting a business, nobody has any idea who you are, where you are, and what you do. So you need to take your customer segments, your targeted customer segments, from unawareness to awareness. And history has said it takes five to seven interactions between you and them for them to be aware of your brand. You then need to take them from awareness to understanding. Understanding what differentiates you from whomever they're getting serviced from today. From, un from understanding, you need to take them to believability that they can believe the differentiator you have eclipses whomever they're using today. Because each one of you, unless you have something absolutely so revolutionary that nobody is providing it, is using somebody to supply their needs today. Then from believability, you go to trial. They try you. If they like you, they buy again. If they really like you, they'll refer you. So this element of channels is critically important for you to build awareness so you can generate customers. Now, if you go back to Waze, their number one way of achieving awareness is word of mouth. Now, I have to tell you, I was in my car going to a client meeting and one of my associates was sitting in the passenger seat. And I said, wait a minute, I need to stop and pull out a map. I'm not quite sure where I am. She said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Just pull up Waze on your phone. I said, what are you talking about? So she pulled it up on her phone and it said, go four miles, turn left, go two miles, to turn right, and your destination is on your left. Word of mouth. I load it on my phone and I use it all the time. It's a free app, fully featured, so it, people can access it easily. And the advertisers come to them rather than they going to the advertisers. So what you want to think about is what are the channels that you're going to use to reach your customers? Now, 
stop. You've done your value proposition. You've done your customer segments. You've done the channels. So block one, two, and three, stop and go out and validate it. Because all you have right now are assumptions. When I was in basic training at Fort Dix in 1969, Sergeant Woodman said, the assumptions you make are the mother of all screw-ups. Not quite like that, but close. So what you want to do is validate it. Go out to customer segments, people that you have defined as your customers, and ask them about your value proposition. Do they, do they see benefit in your value proposition? Will they pay money to achieve your value proposition? And ask them about channels. Where do they get their information? Validate it. Once you validate it, then you can move to the next step. If you can't validate it, you need to go back and review what you did and then validate it again. Mark, someone asks, how do you suggest that people go out and get in touch with their customer segments in order to do that validation? Okay, Let, let's assume that I, I worked with somebody this morning who was working on a golf uh, academy. And one of his customer segments, he believes, are golf teams in high schools. In order to validate his idea on how to bring golf training to golf teams, he needs to go out and talk to some, some golf coaches in high schools and ask them, the value proposition I'm putting forth is, is this something that appeals to you that you would compensate me for? And then ask them, okay, where do you get your information about services and products for your golf team? And they'll say that we get catalogs, I go online, I get a newsletter from the, from the State Association of Golf Coaches, whatever. I find those people and go out and ask them. The woman that was doing grunge clothing for teens, what she did was we, she went to a, a group that she belongs to that had teenage girls and had interviewed them. And said, this is what I'm planning, showed them some of the products, showed them uh, and talked about the value proposition and got input from them. Does that help? Yes. Okay. All right. Next, what's the relationship? Now it's time to think about what's the relationship that you want with your customers. How do you acquire, retain, and grow your customer base? To acquire customers, you need to think in terms of, is this an online? Is this where you have a sales force? Do you send out a newsletter? How do you acquire customers? Do you, have a, 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 do, you do something on Facebook, on LinkedIn? How do you acquire the customers? And what kind of relationship do you expect from them? When, when, we, ha when we go to a restaurant, we go to a restaurant because of the service, the food, the experience we had the prior time. But we also go because the restaurant has a system where they communicate with us periodically, say, hey, we haven't seen you in the last two months. Here's $10 off to come the next time. Or come celebrate your birthday. They have, we have a relationship with them. We're part of their program. So what you want to do is understand What's important to your customers? What will keep them coming back? Is this a once a year? Is this seven times a year to have my lawn fertilized and then they come out and evaluate how the lawn is at the end of the year and make recommendations for the next year? So one of the things you wanna think about is what kind of relationship do you wanna create and what works with your customer base? Well, Waze has casual users. I'm going to play golf next week at the a course I've played all summer long. I don't need it, but I'm going to a new course and born, I need my way. So I use it as needed. I have a relationship with all the communities in this region. So if they have an event this weekend, like the Seaside 
carnival uh, festival in Yarmouth, it'll pop up when I drive through Yarmouth on my ways. So what you want to think about is what kind of relationship do you want with them? When we had our business, our relationship was based on show to show. It might have been annual at their sales meeting for their sales force. It depended on the client. It depended on what their needs were. It depended on how many events they went to. Budweiser was a client of ours. We did one event a year, the Daytona 500. And what they wanted to know was every year, what resonated in their advertising program? Was it the beer? Was it the driver? Was it the event? When Toyota introduced the Tundra truck, Toyota wanted to get very specific information about how they want would interact with their customer base because they were not in the truck business. So think about how you want to communicate, how you want to interact with your customer base. Now, small business people know that it's a 24-7 enterprise. You do everything. But really, do you do everything and should you do everything? So in using the business model canvas, you think about what are all the activities that go into making a business? What, it, what is everything that you have to do in order to create competitive advantage? And competitive advantage is, number one, is another one of those marketing 101 terms. It's where you have a position in the mind of a buyer where they see no suitable substitute. And to gain that, you need to think about all the activities in your business in order to not only attain that competitive advantage, but maintain it. Now, I'll give you an example. For many years, I drove a Volvo from 1974 until last year. Why did I drive a Volvo? Most people say because it's safe. I drove a Volvo because it had the shortest distance from the front of the seat to the back of the seat of any car made. Why? The original creator of the Volvo was vertically challenged, just like I am. And I don't get, didn't get shin splints driving the car. They had to work at maintaining that competitive advantage by making sure the design features of their car stayed true to the size of their seats. So you have to ask yourself, what are all the activities that it takes in order to run your business? It might be sales, might be marketing, might be advertising. It might be production. It might be services. It might, if you're a restaurant, it might be the front, front of, the, of the restaurant. It might be the back of the restaurant. So what are all the activities so that you know what are the most important things that you have to undertake without fail to make the business work and those things that you can delegate. Now, we think about marketing and sales. Marketing is positioning, sales, closing sales. It might be distribution. How do you get the product out to market? I'm sure when Cape Cod Beer started, Beth probably drove the truck. But today, she has a fleet of drivers. And then delivery and follow-up. Who's going to do your follow-up? Who's going to make sure that the promotional activities that you undertake turn into sales? And if you manufacture something or make something, who's going to do that? Are you going to do that yourself? So understanding all the activities of your business and understanding what you're going to do and what somebody else could do. Now, I have to say, having owned a business for almost 30 years, there are two basic functions that you must do yourself. And you must have complete control of yourself. One is sales. And that is generating revenue. Secondly, is cash management. More small businesses fail because they lose track of cash. Now, I have to tell you that I used to get a P&L once a quarter on our business. But I looked at our cash position every single day. 
I knew what we had in the bank. I knew what we owed. I knew who owed us and when it was due. So what you want to think about are what are the activities that it takes in order to make the model work? Well, Waze, it's finding new markets. It's R&D software, making sure that software is constantly being updated. Is somebody out there selling to the advertisers? And then curating data that they can put on the app so that you know what the historical markers are, you know the towns you're going through, you know where the material, where the, the closest Dunkin' Donut is, et cetera. Next, who are our partners? Who are those people that can help us achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve? Now, it could be your bank. You sit down with your bank and you sit down with Robert and you explain where you are and what you're doing and how you're going to do it. And the fact that you may, you're thinking about expanding your businesses and this is what you may need in order to do that. They're your partner. You're their, they're your financial partner. They're also your financial advisor too. What do you think? What do you, how do you feel? Your suppliers are your partners. I had a, I had a, a graphic designer for 27 years. He not only did the graphic design, but he also came up with ideas on how we can communicate our message more effectively. For those of you who have material suppliers, they can be your source of line of credit. Now, there's a different a variety of ways that you can, you can create your partnerships. We used to have strategic alliances with exhibit builders. Why? Because when people buy a new exhibit, they their staff need to be trained how to use the exhibit. So many times they would offer training with the new exhibit build as a competitive advantage, a differentiator. We also had joint ventures where we would go together with exhibit builders. Sometimes, we even work with our competitors, depending on what the size of the project was. Once we did a project for um, Hewlett Packard, where we got two of our competitors to work with us because we had to have so many people on the floor doing measurement. So you want to think in terms of your partners and how they can support you moving forward. So for Waze, it's their big advertisers and the gas chains and community leaders were their partners. <clears throat> so when you think about their key, your key partners, what you want to think in terms of is how did their activities allow you to concentrate on your key activities so that you can stay focused? Those of you who are out there who are small business owners, I can tell one characteristic that makes a small business owner successful, and that's being opportunistic. But also, it's being opportunistic also is an issue because you lose focus. Somebody brings you a great idea, something to expand your business. So what you want to do is cultivate those buying and selling relationships to maximize their advantages and efficiencies to help you maximize your business model and make it work. And your resources. We can't do it all. How do we execute it all? So when we think about whether it be capital, whether it be physical location, whether it be our intellectual property, whatever it is, what do we specifically need to do to attract and keep our customers, keep our employees, and make our organization flourish? So what are the must-haves of our organization? Well, I found this graph that kind of explains the inner workings of an organization. Some of the resources that we need are human, whether it be knowledge, skills, abilities, talents, people. Some of them may be financial. You need launch funding. You need operating funding. You need 
R&D funding some of you. And some of you may need even funding for growth and expansion. It may be physical resources or maybe intellectual properties. I talked to a, a client this morning that was has a patent pending and he's working towards a full patent so that he can protect the innovation that he created. So think about these resources. Think about what do you need in order to make it work? And much of, many of it is outside your organization. Hmm. Mark, let me stop you just for a second. There is a question that came in. Sure. Uh, for many people, the business plan is difficult, complex, and fearful, sometimes a mystery. How and what is SCORE doing to demystify the business plan for the general public? Our mentors have designed a, an approach that is crawl, walk, run. It's small bites. And that's the nice thing about this approach. You don't have to think about this humongous plan. You start with small blocks. Block one, value proposition, customer segment two, channels three. If you need to go to a full plan, then you've got the base built and each block builds on it. So what happens is it's overwhelming because it's so big, the business plan, the full business plan. So if you start with the model business model canvas, it's a small bite. And you can manage the execution of the plan itself. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that's a perfect answer. Okay. All right. So when we think about so what happened here? Okay. When we think about the next block, and that is the costs. What does it cost to start a business? You know, many times I'll say to a, a client, what does it cost to open the doors? What's going to cost you to start day one? That's a launch budget. But then what's it going to cost you to operate the business on an ongoing basis? That's an operating plan. That's an operating budget. So what you want to do is think in terms of what are your fixed costs? What are your variable costs? And this goes back to is understanding accounting 101. But what you want to do is you want to look at fixed costs, and that is what is what are those things that don't vary with sales volume? And what are available costs? And those are the, those that vary with your sales volume, your, your scale. So what you want to do is you want to think in terms of the costs. Now, the other thing you want to think about is cash flow. The number one element in planning may not be a projected profit and loss or projected balance sheet. It's cash flow. How much are you starting with? Month one. What's your revenue? Month one. What are your expenses? Month one. What's your net? And then what do you, how much money do you have left at the month to start the next month? So what you want to do is think in terms of focusing on what is it going to take from an economic standpoint, the, the, the costs that it, to start a business, to run the business, to have positive cash flow? And it, that may take several months in order to get positive cash flow. What's it going to take? And those have to be linked to your revenue. Now, the cost structure for Waze <coughs> is R&D software and infrastructure, maps, and selling to advertisers. <laughs> the other side is revenue. What streams of revenue do you have? Now, when I looked at our business and I look back on it, we had a number of different streams of revenue. We had training, we, we had live training, distance training, and we had product that were used for training. That's three different streams of revenue. We had measurement. We had quantitative measurement. We had qualitative measurement. And in audits, that's another three streams of revenue. So you need to think in terms of where is your revenue going to come from? I was at a, our seamstress this morning to pick up a pair of pants that I had shortened. And I noticed she does 
aquatic type work. She does cushions for boats. She does upholstering and she does clothing. She has three different streams of revenue. So you got to ask yourself, go back to your value proposition, ask what are your customers willing to pay for your value proposition? What are they currently paying? If your price point is higher, are, will they pay more? So what you want to do is think in terms of revenue. Where's the revenue going to come from and how are you going to generate that revenue? Is it on a project basis? Is it on a per activity basis? Is it a subscription basis? Are you going to offer discounts? Do you give rebates? So understanding how you're going to generate revenue against your cost base will determine the potential profitability of your enterprise. So Ways does it by advertising from the roadside businesses. And sometimes it's pay for impression in the real-time market. Now, I told you that the business model canvas may be more than one page. Because one of the things we mentors at SCORE have realized that the one element that was not included in the business model canvas was competition. And when you do a plan, you need to think in terms of who are your key competitors? What do they offer that's different from you? What's the depth and breadth of their offering? And what's the focus of your competitors? How are they positioned in the marketplace? Are they a single location? Are they a niche location? Are they a niche marketer? So you want to think in terms of evaluating and analyzing your competition so you understand what it is that you are going to be doing and what you need to do. We had a client last year that decided to buy an ice cream store here in West Dennis. We asked her, what will differentiate you from the five other ice cream stores that are within, within one mile of their location? And they told us. So we went together online and looked at all the ice cream stores within a one mile radius of that store and three different ones offered the same differentiator. So this is the time to find that out when you're doing the planning. How will you communicate your message to the marketplace? So think in terms of looking at the competition, looking at their brand, what's their brand value? What are they communicating? How are they communicating? So that you are prepared to face what it is they're going to be doing when you enter the marketplace. Now, when we think about the business model canvas, as you think about it, those nine blocks, think about the fact that there's two sides of it, the supply side, which is partners, activities, and resources, the demand side, which are customers, customer relationships, and channels, and then there's the value and business value side, and that is the value proposition as it relates to customers and the business value, which is revenue and cost. If you think in those terms, then you now have a different perspective on talking about, explaining about your business and the business model that will demonstrate sustainability as you move, move forward. And that's the important part. When you think about a business plan, what you're doing is telling a story about your business and how you will become a sustainable entity. Winston Churchill said it, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. I can't tell you the number of businesses that I see where people just opened the door and hoped that things would work out. As a friend of mine once said, hope is not a strategy. So you need to think in terms of utilizing a plan. 
that gets you from point A to point B and allows you to achieve the goals you've set for yourself. Now, the handout that we have has a full appendix that has the traditional business plan outline on it. Jim is going to make this available so that it can be sent out with the video, with the audio of this uh, session. I think it's time to turn it back to Jim. Any questions for yeah, Mark. Jim or Robert? Uh, first question, Mark, is, is identifying these things similar to doing market research? Yes. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Yeah. Market research is very important. For example, some, somebody asked a question about how do you validate? That's market research. You get out there and talk to the resource and gain information. Now, you can do primary research, and that is I'm going to go down the street and talk to the ice cream shop and ask him what his differentiator is. Or I can do secondary research, go online, pull up their website, and see what they say. Uh, someone asks, how long should I stay on a social media platform if I do not see a lot of growth? Well, it takes multiple interactions with a customer. If you're trying to reach a, a customer base, you need five to seven independent interactions that a, cust a potential customer has a chance to see in order to gain awareness, to even know that you're there. So patience is important. Having variety is important. Having consistency in messaging is important, but having variety in look of look is important. But the important thing is don't give up too soon. And I, I just want to throw in here real quick. Um, we do have three representatives with us today from the East Cambridge Savings Bank. So you have a unique opportunity to not only ask a question to a SCORE mentor, but to a, a bank representative. Um, so... I would like to ask, or I have a question here. Um, is there anything in particular that the bank is looking for when they look at a business um, outline? Um, sure. So, so typically, we we see business plans um, more so with, with, with startups, not not so much existing businesses that have been around for three, four, five, ten years. Mostly startups, and more the better. Um, we look we i mean we want profitability but but cash flow is is huge um I, I was told early on um in my career that um cash flow is actually better than profitability um you agree with that? thank thank you mark okay so i'm not i'm not out in, in our space okay um so more detailed the better um but yeah definitely uh it's 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 the cash flow uh, there's another question for the bank. Um, someone asked, what do I need to create an account as I start up my nonprofit? So each each bank is is different. Um, typically with with nonprofits, um, I'll, I'll have to um, I might have to circle back with you, but if you have my contact information, I can um, Give that to you, but but typically with, with, with nonprofits, uh, the articles of organization um, information regarding the board of directors, if if there is one, um, th there isn't a, a, a copy of ID. Um, there isn't. It's not overly complex. Whether it's an S corp, C corp, uh, a nonprofit, sole proprietor, but um, we can talk offline on that. And that can be. More, more precise. I would just have to go back to the, 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 the to the bank and and just I want I want to give, get you the right information. Sure. Would you want to put your um, email in the chat? So oh yeah, yeah, folks, good idea. I wasn't yeah, sure because you're right. It would be different depending on the situation for the you know what the nonprofit or profit organization yep. is and yeah. Not Back bad. to that social media platform question, I would expand on what Mark had to say. You need to make sure that you don't just throw something up on the platform and expect a miracle. 
You need to continue to use those platforms to get your messaging out consistently so that you make sure that you are reaching as many people as you can. It may not be the platform's fault. Does a business plan um, help when applying for a mortgage? Is it is it considered a startup even after five years? Um, so is is the mortgage so so is is a home mortgage um, owner occupied real estate where the actual business would 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 be in, in the real estate? Um, it, it, I would assume it's commercial or something. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. I mean, well, well typically. Um, we would more importantly would be the cash flow that could cover cover the mortgage and then some so it, it's really we, we want to learn about the business understand the business understand understand financials that sort of thing where you've been what you what you're doing now where you are in the future um but it's it's not overly it, it's not required to have a business plan because it, you'd be up and running. And if it's been say five years, we would basically look at your interim financials, but more importantly, your, your, your cash flow and, and business tax returns. Actually, we got clarification. It's actually the person says it's an individual private home, not commercial, but she works from home. I'm assuming that's just going to be a residential mortgage that you would There'll be a residential them. mortgage. So just tax returns and, and no business plan. Uh, another question is, uh, what's a typical loan amount for a new business and what kind of collateral is necessary to show? Um, so when, when it comes to startups, very uh, when you look at startups, regional banks, large banks, that they won't touch startups for, for, for the most part uh, due to the risk. Smaller community banks, such as East Cambridge Savings Bank, will we, we will consider startups. Um, we, we've seen them as low as ten to fifteen thousand, uh, up to fifty thousand uh, dollars for for a startup. In terms of collateral, would you typically expect a personal guarantee from the owner of the business? Of 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 course, yeah. P yeah. A PG, a personal guarantee, is is definitely one hundred percent of the time required. Uh, someone said, asks, "I'm developing business credit with suppliers, net thirty types." But how do I strengthen this type of credit to make large purchases? Uh, can you? I, don't, I, don't, I didn't see that in the webinar check. Can you repeat that? Yeah, it's in the Q and A actually. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'll, I'll move over. Okay. It's, it's the last question in the Q and A. Credit with suppliers net thirty. Okay. How do I strengthen this type of credit to make large purchases? Uh, that, that's that's it. That's a good question because this is this has come across um, in the past, where where a uh, business would would come to me and they typically would would want maybe their the, what would happen is their supplier would reach out to the bank saying hey this ABC company they, they want to make a large purchase can you provide us three months of bank statements. Uh, that sort of thing and and that that's I, I sign off on that um but in that particular but in this particular situation i don't i don't i don't think it's the same um can i jump in here sure, yeah yeah go ahead Mark. Yeah. yeah i think there's two things one if you're trying to make larger purchases from a a supplier then and you're trying to increase the amount of credit they will give you then paying your bills in quicker than 30 days shows them that you have the ability to undertake uh, the credit they're giving you. Secondly, uh, asking them specifically what it is it takes for, for them to advance you more credit for larger purchases is the way to go. Because every company is different. Every company has different credit requirements. Um, but the... My, the history that I have, I've been involved in manufacturing during my career. And if we wanted to increase the amount of purchases from a specific uh, uh, supplier, uh, it was a function of, of our current payment cycle and then finding out what they demand from us in order to increase uh, purchases from them. Uh, with this further clarification to this question, uh, I, the person is 
asking about leasing large equipment and buying a van. Uh, I think for that, as opposed to the ordinary net that's suppliers, different. that's a different thing. Different. You're going to be going to the equipment seller. And frankly, in my view, they are oftentimes the most likely source of credit for a small business. Right. Uh, because you can lease that equipment from them. They're in the business of leasing that equipment. They understand that equipment uh, and can take it back if they need to and have a ready market for it. So that's going to be something of showing your credit worthiness, the fact that the business pays its bills on time, uh, and then dealing directly with the equipment supplier or the van supplier. Right. I agree with that. Um Okay, one you know, last. That's, I remember. I remember in the past, so that that's come up too, where where the supplier would would, would come to the bank or, or or myself and be like, hey, hey, have they had any overdrafts? Right. But that, that's that's a big thing too. And they'll you know, definitely do a credit check. Um, yeah, of course. Yep. In whatever way they can. Uh, and then uh, the one last question that we'll have time for, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, someone asks, are there any credit card companies or types of credit cards that you recommend for small businesses? Um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, we're not uh, in the business of recommending specific companies or specific opportunities, but I do strongly recommend that if you can, you get a credit card for your business and that you use it only for the business, because it is a way that you can begin to build credit for your business itself. Um, there are a long list of credit card issuers that you could you could deal with. Uh, from uh, Visa to MasterCard to Discover, et cetera, um, and issuers from all the banks. Um, and I don't know whether the bank itself has a point of view on this, but clearly having a business credit card is a valuable thing to get. Yes, it allows you to keep your keep your expenses separate, uh, tracks your expenses. Um, many, many businesses do fine with, with a small business debit card that's linked to their, their checking account. Um, 100% of the time, always set up a separate business account for your business and keep your business business expenses separate from your personal expenses. I know it's very straightforward, self-explanatory, but I've come uh, across um, where everything- Lots done. don't do it. No question. Lots don't do it, and it's a big mistake. Big yeah. mistake. Keep and track costly, of your business costly, separately. Costly mistake. Yep. So if there's one thing you do, and we talk about this when we do our cash flow webinar- Always keep your business account separate from your personal account. Don't run your personal expenses through it. Don't run your business expenses through your personal account. Keep your credit card separate. Just keep the business separate from your personal life and your personal finances because that's the only way that you can easily track the real course of the business's cash flow performance. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and thank uh, Mark for a fantastic presentation and um, East Cambridge Savings Banks for their sponsorship and Jim for his assistance. So um, thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.